Hi there and welcome to Central Texas Gardener. I'm Tom Spencer. I like to use a lot of different textures to keep attention moving from one garden space to another. Today, designer Scott Thurman explains why he includes plants with soft structure along with a few ideas to get us started. On tour, see how this gardener made the most of her small garden. Loretta Fisher's glad that it took a while to create her garden. If she'd had time to do it when she owned a bakery, she would have picked a completely different style. But now she's come to terms with what's best for her and her husband Terrell and their small house and yard. Structural elegance and low maintenance, not the intense cottage garden she imagined. To learn more about plants, she went through Master Gardener training in 2004. I wanted to meet more people that love gardening and I had a friend of mine that said, um, go see the Master Gardeners. I didn't really even know what a Master Gardener was. I just thought they were like super gardeners. I didn't realize, you know, what a volunteer organization, you know, how much they do for the community and just, you know, the information that they give out to people that is, you know, so valuable and I learned so much and I've just met so many great people. While helping others, she's found new ideas for her own garden. In front, Loretta discarded overgrown shrubs and ivy that concealed the house and diminished its size. Their clutter also distracted from the garden's anchor, a 60-year-old magnolia. So I just wanted to simplify it so that the magnolia just would shine. To span a drainage culvert for a more direct route to the front door, her brother Harrison Bates designed a bridge. When I had it built, I asked the guy, I said, now I want this bridge to be high hill friendly. She spent days painting and sealing, its color bringing out the magnolia and the house. My friend Roxanne named uh, the bridge Bob and it means big orange bridge and it's pretty incredible i love that bridge the moment i saw it when it was delivered on a flatbed trailer and it was just the color of steel i jumped up on that flatbed trailer and i said this is it she was just as bold in the side yard that pulls visitors into the back Since she and Terrell liked to entertain, she made the most of every inch of limited space. I was in the food business for about 20 years. I had a bakery for 10 years. And um, so I've done a lot of production cooking. And so it's no big deal for just, you know, to have 50 people over and put on a spread. And this yard is perfect for it. Um, you can get a lot of people in here. With close lot lines, privacy was the first consideration. Since Loretta likes to enjoy the garden from inside, night or day, she built a half trellis with evergreen vines that screens the windows but lets them see out. Pea gravel replaced lawn, which was sparse in the shade, and with drainage runoff a muddy mess even in trace rain. Its surface is more conducive for entertaining and low maintenance for her. Since she couldn't physically enlarge the space, she did it with mirrors. The mirrors were put up because I had them for about nine years. I've been dragging them around from house to house, always thinking I was gonna put them in my gym. And then when I moved into this house, well, there really wasn't room for a gym or to put a bunch of mirrors. And so one day, this is just like a lot of things, the way things happen in this garden, my brother, he says, hey, let's put the mirrors on the fence. And so we put them up and went, wow, what a stroke of genius. Another happenstance was finding the right tables for strong visual impact. Made of concrete, a gully washer won't bother them. You can dance on them if you want to. Although the tables aren't easily moved, Loretta likes the flexibility of container plants to rearrange for a gathering or a seasonal change. Her favorite specimens inspired her next project. 
The reason I built the greenhouse was because I have a lot of tropicals and my husband wanted the one car garage that we had turned into his office and that's where I usually sho shove all the tropicals every winter. So I asked my brother, uh, hey can you build me a garden shed? And he said sure. Rather than blockade the small yard, Harrison's design brings reflected light into it. Along with storing paint and tools, it's a comfortable winter conservatory. When Harrison installed the support pillars, Loretta had another idea, a pool. Together, they poured and shaped the concrete. The pool is, I think, the most exciting thing about this greenhouse because it's so unusual. It's a pentagon-shaped pool. It's uh, about half of it is underneath the greenhouse. And I knew that I wanted something to sit in because it's so hot in the summer. And, you know, when you're working in the garden, there's nothing better than just, you know, to cool off and then just keep going. There's another benefit to Harrison's design. The greenhouse lights up like a lantern, like a garden lantern at night. Harrison also built a light pole, controlled by a dimmer that Loretta installed. At full blast, she can read by it. Subdued, it's like a large candle to dine by. Loretta's garden didn't happen overnight, and it's continually changing. But for her, the process is what it's all about. Thanks, Loretta, for sharing your garden with us. Right now, we're going to be talking about soft structure for the garden. And we have Scott Thurman, one of our favorite guests on Central Texas Gardener. Welcome back. It's always great to see you, Scott. Thank you, Tom. Uh, you're always real busy uh, designing gardens. And uh, the, one of the things I really love about the places that you work on are the combinations of plants. And you've brought an amazing assortment of things uh, to share with us today, some really cool things. Um, this is an interesting concept, soft <laughs> structure. <laughs> yeah, that threw me for a bit of a <laughs> But it was kind of fun to think about it and sort of come up with different ways to mm -hmm. project that. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you think about uh, flowing plants, things that have kind of these graceful forms or movement in them, that, and they certainly soften up the structure in the plants. And uh, we're going to just, I think, dive in and start talking about all these different cool species, if you don't mind. And the, the first one is a, a new plant to me, and this is a relative of our native Satoll, uh, which I think of as being a vicious plant. This one looks pretty benign. Yeah, that one's pretty friendly. <laughs> yeah. Um, Desilarion longissimum, or Mexican grass palm. Mm -hmm. uh, real nice, needly but soft structure. Right. Uh, no like sharp needles. Not, so. No sharp needles. Much right. friendlier to work with than the native so tall. Yeah. The, one of the, the things in my old garden, I had a grouping of satolls, which looked terrific in a group. But uh, talk about trouble weeding. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's easy to get your hand in there. But when you try to get them back out, exactly. it's not so much fun. Well, tell me about this plant real briefly. Uh, it's slow to moderate growing can eventually form a trunk up to 10 feet tall, ah, but mm -hmm. that's probably for your grandkids to enjoy. Okay, so that uh, far down the road, okay. Uh, but potentially up to about six feet wide. Okay, well, very cool. Uh, really like the look of this one. We have, a, a, of course, it is a xeric plant. You can tell just by looking at it. Immediately adjacent to it, we have a form of Bodleia. Uh, called the woolly buddleia, and uh, this is one where very evidently soft looking leaves, so I get that part of the softness here. Soft looking leaves, uh, nice gray form, mm -hmm. about three feet by three feet, uh, orange ball flowers as opposed to the long panicles of most buddleias, mm -hmm. uh, blooms through, scattered throughout in the summer. Yeah, very cool looking plant. I love this. I love the color of the blooms. Silver and orange is a great combo, I think. It is a great combo. And uh, that's one that I think would be a star for a lot of people who have hot, dry spaces, right? And I hear the hummingbirds like it a lot as well. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Anyway, well, it makes sense. Most of the buddleias are very attracted to butterflies, etc. Well, we have uh, a lot of uh, plants over here. Again, large, beautiful group of things. We're going to start off by talking about 
the Jerusalem sage, and I love the big floppy leaves on this one. Yeah, that's a large leaf Jerusalem sage, and again, that's another definition of soft because the yeah. uh, the leaves are soft and fuzzy. Right. Uh, yeah. That one gets about four feet wide and about four feet tall. And uh, again, t uh, a good plant for a lot of different situations. One of the things that surprises me about this is it actually it seems to do pretty well in the shade. Uh, yeah, the larger leaf one will do quite well mm -hmm. in the shade. Yeah. Um, not all day. Not all day. Dappled right. sun. Mm -hmm. Keep it a little more on the dry side if it's in more shade. Right. But uh, big, bold uh, leaves, a uh, nice soft texture to that, and beautiful yellow flower. So a great choice. I always love uh, the cannas, and the one that you brought in is one that I don't think I've ever seen before, Scott. This is Canna Australis. And... Uh, Love the color on this. This is, you know, you often see these kind of dark burgundy cannas that are striped, but nothing this solid. Yeah, that's a beautiful one. It gets about five feet tall, um, red orange flowers in the summertime. Mm -hmm. uh, a little little bit of extra water when we get into August, right? Uh, when we're really dry, but it's, it's pretty tough. Uh huh. Is it as aggressive as some of the other cannas? Uh, you'll probably want to share something with some friends occasionally. At some point. <laughs> okay. In other words, be warned. <clears throat> Actually, cannas aren't that bad. They're easy to work with. They're easy very to easy with. to dig up. Very, very easy. So, uh, Canna Australis, no common name on that one that I'm aware of. Uh, not that I'm aware of either. Okay. okay. Next to that, we have a big, a big floppy, soft-looking pile of miscanthus. <laughs> And this is a, a cultivar that's been around for a few years. Yeah, that's Miscanthus Cabaret. Uh, that's a pretty large Miscanthus. It can easily get, you know, five feet tall, maybe even six and mm -hmm. four feet wide. Uh, and this is one, again, sun, semi-shade, does pretty well in the semi-shade. Uh, love all the ornamental grasses, but this is one, if you like that bold variegation, I think these are probably the best of those. Yeah. It's one of the strongest variegated. Yeah, anyway, so good choice for a lot of people out there in a lot of different situations. We have, um, there are lots of different forms of Rudbeckia out there. My, one of my favorite all-time garden plants is Rudbeckia goldstrom, which is, you know, a really super performer. Black-eyed Susan, common name for these plants. This is one that I've never seen before. Uh, this is cabbagey almost. Yeah, yeah, it's great form, uh, nice blue-gray leaves. Uh, uh, Rebecca Maxima, the bloom spikes can get up to five, six feet tall. Awesome. And, uh, you know, great. Big yellow Yeah, straps. big yellow flowers. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I really love those blue gray leaves and that yeah. was a spectacular in bloom and out. Yeah, well there you go. And, and that's not always the case with them. Sometimes they kind of crater after blooming and, uh, you know, not always very attractive. That's a beautiful plant. Grass lily, uh, love the look of this thing, and I have, I'm ashamed, I don't know anything about this plant. This is, it looks terrific. It's the little white flower with the, obviously the grass-like texture. Uh, yeah, it's related to the house plant that a lot of people grow, airplane plant or ah. spider plant. Duh, uh, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a perennial clump forming, uh, mm -hmm. usually about 18 inches tall and wide. Okay, <clears throat> yeah. well. Anthericum, I believe, is the botanical name on that. Evergreen in the ground here? Uh, usually. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, usually. All usually. Right. Well, you know, I know a lot of people just stick the airplane plant in the ground and it becomes a ground cover. Yeah. And so, okay, there you go. Uh, grass lily. Now, the, this, the next plant is a verbascum. Yeah. And this is, is one that I don't think we've talked about before on the show as well. That's the little more mannerly garden version of the common mullein that you see okay. growing around here. That's for Bascom Southern Charm. Okay. Uh, nice, tall spike of pink flowers. Mm -hmm. uh, good kind of cottage garden plant. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I think of when I think plants like this is uh, an old-fashioned period almost mm -hmm. cottage garden. Uh, nice flower spike. And you say, a mannerly, mullen-like plant. <laughs> okay, well, we'll take your word for the mannerly part of that. Uh, immediately adjacent to that, Scott, we have uh, another form of miscanthus. This is a, a really widely hybridized uh, uh, plant family, lots of different forms of this. Uh, this is called zebra, and uh, it's pretty evident why. Yeah, miscanthus, that one's gold bar. It's a newer, improved introduction. Uh, smaller than the cabaret, about three feet by about two feet wide. Yeah. Very cool, and you often see the striated uh, variation where it follows the length of the leaf, but to see it banding like this, 
I th that's, it's just very cool, very striking. And again, uh, the same thing can be said about this as the other Miscanthus, a, a relatively uh, tough little plant uh, that is widely adapted and uh, really quite striking in the garden and provides that soft grass-like texture that a lot of people want. This, this next uh, plant we're gonna talk about, I am in love with this, just seeing it here. In the, and this is a Philadelphus. Which I and I love the Philadelphus, the mock oranges, uh, and the fragrance often is superb on these plants. This one actually has got a little spicy fragrance to it. Yeah, I was very pleased when I when I noticed the fragrance on that one. I, when I first saw it, I thought, oh, it's not going to be that fragrant, but it, it's delicious. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a dwarf form called snowflake. It matures at about three to four feet, uh -huh. by about three to four feet wide. And if, for people not familiar with the Phil Philadelphus or mock oranges, these are plants that probably would prefer to be a little bit east of here. Yeah. So, uh, so in uh, good garden soil, and I'd say protection from afternoon sun, wouldn't you? Morning sun and afternoon shade. Yeah, this is, but a great little plant, and just, they come in bloom, and it's just like this amazing show when they're in bloom. Yeah, they're really spectacular. Yeah, love the Philadelphus, okay. Um, love this next plant too, a Crinum sangria, and this is a Crinum that has a super uh, color in the foliage. A lot of crimes, the foliage is actually a detraction, not here. Yeah, the foliage is kind of the star here, although the flowers are pretty spectacular too. There's uh -huh. big pink clusters of, of kind of thin petaled flowers Okay. in and the summertime. But bloom May, June, May, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, I really love the foliage color on that one, and okay. you get a big mass of uh, three to four foot wide, strappy, burgundy leaves. Okay. Well, Scott, we're, we've plowed through almost all of our time. I'm gonna uh, throw my director a curveball. I wanna talk about one last plant, just ever briefly, and this is the Grevillea behind me. Uh, just, you gotta tell me a little bit about this plant. I absolutely love the look of this. Um, I'm kind of enamored with those two. They're native of Australia. They're newer in the Austin area. Mm -hmm. I'm still experimenting with some of them. Yeah. Um, on their cold hardiness, that one is bonfire, and it's about, 20 degrees. Okay, well, gorgeous color, great looking plant, love the thread-like uh, foliage as well as the bloom. You always blow me away with your plant, Scott. Scott Thurman, landscape designer, a great plantsman, always a pleasure to have you on the program. Learn something every time you come on the show, so thanks for being our guest today. Thank you, Tom. All right, great. Coming up next is our friend Skip Richter. Hello and welcome to Down to Earth. This week's question regards summer color in the landscape. You might have noticed that in the spring, everything seems to want to bloom. It's easy to have beautiful flowers, all kinds of color in the landscape. When summer heat arrives, those disappear by and large and we end up with a sea of green in the landscape. Well, we have some blooms that do well in the summer, things like plumbago with the blue blooms, esperanza with its yellow blooms, and some others. But the best way to have summer color is with foliage plants. Foliage plants provide you that continuous color on through the year. In shady areas, caladiums are a bright way to add foliage with white and red color into the landscape. Also out in the sun areas, things like the copper plant do really well. We have many plants that have beautiful, attractive foliage color, and don't forget that white is a color too. Even things like Aztec grass that do like a shady area really help brighten up the shade. When you use white in dark areas, it brightens it up a lot. So look for some of the foliage color plants that we can plant around the landscape and you'll really brighten things up. I like to use uh, all kinds of things that are a little bit unusual to kind of create a dramatic, stark contrast to that sea of green. Out in the landscape, or first of all, our plant of the week is plumbago. Plumbago has beautiful blue blossoms and there's also a white blooming form. It takes the heat exceptionally well. It likes full sun, but it really likes to be in partial shade and can take quite a bit of shade and still bloom quite well. If you put it in the sun, you're gonna have to water it a little bit more, but it's still a fairly uh, drought tolerant plant. Out in the landscape, it's time to watch for those pests that tend to show up this time of year and mass to really take things out. That would include caterpillars and beetles, mites and aphids. 
All of these start by feeding a little bit here and there, and then as they create new generations and multiply many times over, they can really wipe out a planting. So get out and do a little early morning walk around with a cup of coffee and check for damage on your plants. When you notice damage starting to happen, that's the time when it's easiest to control. So by getting in there early and controlling things early on with a very safe, low toxicity spray, you can help shut things down when it's easier to control. Once you have severe damage and pests are everywhere, it's much more difficult. So early control is important. Any new woody ornamentals that were planted last fall in the winter or the spring need to be given good care. It's hot outside now and there's a lot of demands on them and they're still starting to get a good root system established. It takes a while for them to develop a root system that can go through these Central Texas summers. If you provide them a little bit of extra water, I like to build that berm around the plant and give them a good soaking. Just make sure that you don't keep them too wet. In black clay soils that are quite common through the area, you find that those underground planting holes tend to become underground bathtubs and you can overwater and if the roots sit in water, that's deadly to them. So enough water, but not too much. That's a little tricky for a new plant, but it's very important this first season. Roses need to continue to be fertilized and sheared back following periods of bloom. That keeps them vigorous and producing new blooms. So continue to feed your roses and water them well. And all those summer flowers like Celosia and Cosmos, Portulaca, Zinnia and others can still be planted now for good looking color. For more plant tips or to contact your extension office, visit klru.org ctg. Thanks, Skip. Now let's check in with Trisha Shirey for Backyard Basics. One of the ways that you can bring your garden indoors and enjoy it even longer is by making potpourri from your herbs and flowers in your garden. Now, not all flowers dry well and not all herbs dry well either. So there will be a list of suggested plants to use on our Central Texas Gardener website under Trisha's Corner. So be sure to check that out. You may have more growing in your yard that's useful for potpourri than you realize. And my motto is I'll dry anything once. If it looks good, fine. If not, toss it in the compost pile and start over. Now you do want to make sure your materials are dried before you assemble your potpourri and there are a couple of ways to do this. You can cut the herbs when they're uh, even a little bit wilted, they'll dry even better, and tie them with a rubber band. You always want to use a rubber band because if you use a twist tie, these herbs shrink as they dry, they'll fall right out on the floor. So hang that in a place that's got good air circulation and uh, out of direct sunlight. And then once these are dry, you can pull the leaves off the stems and assemble your potpourri. You can also cut the fresh herb stems and just strip them off of the, the stems, the leaves off the stems, and put them in a basket or a cookie sheet or uh, any kind of a low flat container and allow them to dry that way and just kind of toss them and uh, mix them up every couple of days to make sure that they're drying well. And then once they're really good and dry, really nice and crispy, then you can assemble uh, your leaves and flowers to make your potpourri. A couple of other things you may want to add. Now I've got a pomegranate tree. It's an ornamental pomegranate. Those are nice for potpourri. This is the uh, flower pod, the seed pod of butterfly jasmine. And that's one of my favorite things to have just sitting on top of the uh, potpourri container. And if you pick it when it's green, it'll stay green or you can let it turn various stages of brown and it'll be pretty that way too poppy pods. Make sure you get the seeds out of the pods, but uh, the poppy pods are nice. This is nigella, and nigella seed pods are beautiful to put in your potpourri. They're very delicate. And uh, gomfrina and all of its colors is one of my favorites, just one of the best uh, to give a pop of color in a potpourri, and there are many, many other things. Now I take the uh, fixative type materials, which are things like uh, cinnamon sticks, orange peel, traditionally orris root is used, but a lot of people are allergic to orris root, which is a type of iris root. So I don't tend to use that, but I put the fixative type materials and uh, put those in a jar with essential oils and uh, make sure it's a glass jar with a tight fitting lid and just give it a shake every couple of days. Keep it in a cool place out of sunlight and that allows the essential oils that you put in to really permeate those materials. 
And uh, then once that has had a chance to sit for a couple of weeks, mix that with your dried flowers, uh, lavender petals, roses petals, uh, whatever you have. And then you can display it in pretty baskets, in bowls, tie it up in a pretty handkerchief. And you'll have potpourri to put around your house and to share that's made with uh, wonderful natural fragrances and beautiful things from your garden. So I think you'll really enjoy having some potpourri. Be sure to check out our website for ideas with uh, using potpourri and flower suggestions for you and herb suggestions as well. For more tips, online video, and the blog, check out klru.org ctg. Next week, Kurt Hudgens shows us how to grow plumerias. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. Visit klru.org ctg to learn more about today's program, upcoming events, and to sign up for our electronic newsletter. Check out John's how-to tips and visit Trisha's Corner for ideas inside and out. Get growing at klru.org ctg.